What we didn't know at the time is, in the other hand, he had a knife and he was charging at Mike to poke some holes in him. Hey gang, if you're listening to this right now, odds are you watch videos on the main channel and you've seen how important speed and accuracy are in a gunfight. That's why Active Self Protection recommends the Range Tech Shot Timer. I'll tell you, it's the lowest cost shot timer on the market that we're aware of. Bluetooth compatible with any Android or iOS device. More features than any other shot timer. You can store all your data on the cloud for free. That's free. Native integration with practice core and a visual light-based go signal. Visit them at rangetechtimer.com, rangetechtimer.com, and tell them your friends at the Active Self-Protection Podcast sent you. All righty, gang. Welcome back to the Active Self-Protection Podcast. I am once again your host, Mike Williver, and I am your favorite former Fed with us today. Another new friend of mine. His name is Anthony. Uh, Anthony has a, well, a pretty harrowing uh, tale to tell. Uh, Not all of our stories are quite this uh, dramatic and serious, but this one definitely is. Uh, He is currently a finished carpenter. He previously worked in the oil and gas industry, and that will will come into play later on in the story. So Anthony, thank you so much for for writing in and coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you. Thanks for having me, and uh, I appreciate the work you guys are doing. Yeah, I, it's uh, you know, the the longer I've been doing, I've been doing this couple of two years now that I've been working with John directly, and the the longer that I do it, the more gratifying it is to hear from people who have gotten some insight from any number of the people on the channel and the extra channel as far as preparation and training and, and what to do. So uh, that's that's great. I appreciate you saying that. So talk to us. Can you give us a general idea of what part of the country you're in, just generally speaking? Yeah, I'm on the East Coast. I live in Connecticut. Okay, very good. So the nor- the northeast uh, is it is it getting warm there yet, or is it still frigidly cold? No, it's uh, it's actually warming up a little bit. We got lucky uh, with barely having a winter this year. Nice. Talk to me about um, before any of this incident occurred. Um, you 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 told me you worked in the oil and gas industry, and that comes into play in the story as far as preparation and being able to plan for things. Uh, other than that, are you were you a self defense minded person your whole life? Were you um, concealed weapons holder, or martial arts, anything like that? Um, yes, uh, I come from a family. My father was a cop, a police officer for thirty years. Um, my uncle, um, most of my male cousins, they're all cops. So I grew up around firearms, and uh, you know, got training from them. Um, did a little bit of boxing and karate coming up as a kid, and a uh, little bit of mixed martial arts uh unofficially with like got friends but yeah yes definitely uh self-defense minded very cool so uh, the incident at hand is rather it's kind of complicated there's a lot of moving parts so if you want to just in your own words kind of start with the before the actual incident kind of walk us through what was going on in your life uh, there was a wedding involved just talk us through kind of the the relationships and what was happening Okay, so my girlfriend of 15 years, um, she was, uh, her sister was getting married, and uh, everything went well that day, and we went to the wedding, and then had the reception, and then a bunch of people wound up back at her sister's house, Mm -hmm. and uh, the groom, uh, he became heavily intoxicated, and uh, started arguing with his new wife and during the argument um one one of um somebody said started yelling at him one of the children started yelling at him and said something along the lines of you touch your kids uh and i really couldn't believe my ears but all i know is that things got real crazy real fast um so the groom um who actually has a violent past um he was in prison for 13 years for armed robbery um went ballistic he start he he looked specifically at me because i was kind of standing in between and he knew i heard this uh what what they said and he just started going ballistic he said if if you call the cops, I will cut your effing head off. I'm not going back to prison. And uh, it escalated from there. Wow. So he's so, so right off the bat, we're at the reception. He's so inebriated as to be considered drunk. 
and, and there, there's a child making an accusation uh, of, of molestation. How, how, can I ask how old that the, the child that spoke up, how old that child was approximately? Well, the, the children that he was molesting um, at the time, five years ago, I think 14 and um, 11, maybe. Um, so th this is the tough part. It's kind of tough a little bit to talk about, sure. but um, so he he went ballistic. Um, he charged at the kid, but I was standing in between them, and I kind of um, grabbed him and shoved him back. And he st uh, he was really uh, intoxicated, so he you know his knees were weak, and I pushed him back pretty good, and he came back and started punching the walls and and uh and uh flipped over the table it, it got really crazy fast so my number one was to get the kids get them into my uh vehicle and get them out of there now not nobody really heard what the accusation was me and my girlfriend heard it um and we just decided we had to get those kids out of there and get them out now and that's what we did. For the sake of the audience, um, you may have mentioned it, and, and I didn't catch it. So these are whose children that you're getting out of there? My girlfriend's nieces, uh, her sister's children. And she, the sister being the bride in this situation? Uh, yes. Okay, 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 okay. I'm with you. Um, I wanted to clarify that before we move on. So you get him in the car. What happens next? Well, believe it or not, because there was such a disturbance in the house as I was trying to leave the driveway the police pulled in and they kind of detained us there for a minute because i had a uh vehicle full of hysterical children mm -hmm. and i was trying to leave and get back to my house to find out like if what i heard is what i heard because sure. i really wasn't sure to be honest i was kind of in shock um so the i i told the police he's smashing up the house i really didn't mention anything about the accusations that he just basically this guy was very intoxicated and he was smashing up the house and they let us go on our way and we took the children back to my house and everybody that was left at his house was unaware of the accusation we were the only ones that heard that interesting okay so you get the kids back to your house i, I assume you start asking questions and and you know tell me what you're what you meant by that well, um, I actually, at that point, um, uh, the groom's name is James, and he, again, he, he's got a violent uh, past, and I believed him. He threatened me with that uh, to kill me, so I actually believed him. So I sat outside, and um, my girlfriend, Carla, she was started questioning the children, and I was just kind of, you know, set a perimeter to, you know, make sure that he didn't come. Because when the cop showed up that uh, he he actually ran out the black back door and fled um, when, when the cop showed up to his house. So they were not able to contact him at the time? They were not. He, he took off. So do are you able to talk to the police again that night or how did that work out? So, no, because um, what, what happened was we we talk to the kids through the morning and I mean, until the morning. And then I wanted to get everybody else out of that house into my house and let the mother and uh, grandfather and uh, the extended family know what was happening. So basically I made phone calls first thing in the morning and got everybody to my house. Okay. And the idea behind that, I know this from your email, the idea behind that is we want to set up a defensible space. This guy is almost certainly going to show up at some point. So we want to get everybody um, in a safer spot and have a plan in place. Is that, is that accurate? Um, well, honestly, at that point, I was kind of worried about everybody else's safety. So yeah, I was trying to get everybody to my house where, um, yeah, where we could I, uh, put up a defense if, if he showed up. So as you're making these suggestions, is anyone giving you any pushback? Like why, why this sort of poo pooing it? Like, oh, we don't need to do that. It'll be fine. I'm sure nothing will happen. Or is everybody kind of like, okay, this guy's dangerous. So we're going to, we're going to listen to. You know, um, over the years, because this, you know, this, this um, guy, he was involved with uh, Carla's sister for um, 
you know, I don't know how long they were together, five or six years. So um, he, he's not a good trunk and he would fly off the handle. So everybody at that point kind of just thought it was another belligerent drunk uh, type thing. And I don't know why anybody ever put up with it, but they did. So everybody got to my house and nobody, you know, we broke the news of what was actually happening. And it was bad what we heard. I mean, it was like disturbingly bad. So we got everybody there and that's when we called the police um, and two towns responded, the town that I live in and the town that they live in. Both uh, towns sent out um, officers to my house. Very good. I'm glad they were at least coordinating that early on. So the police come out uh, and I assume either you or the minor child um, fills them in on what's been going on and what's their response to that? Well, I filled them in as much as I could. Um, as far as the minor children, they said they were not allowed to talk to them, that there was some sort of therapist officer or something um, to talk to the minors. So what happened was they decided that they were going to um, try to pick him up on a warrant for threatening me to kill me. Mm -hmm. So um, he he's unaware that we notified the police at this point, and he isn't like I don't think he knew what was going on um so we had the children's grandfather text um James and see where he was because the story was that he was going to go to the house and pick up clothes and whatever that the, the kids needed and James texts back that he was home and it was good to come over so the police tried to um the police showed up there again. He saw him coming down the driveway. He bolts out the back door and that's about that. So, yeah. And now um, you have this angry belligerent guy who now knows that you set him up with the cops. So he's, he's definitely now not in a good mood. Correct. Yes. So walk us through what happened after that. So he, he bails off into the, into the wind, as we say in law enforcement. And, uh, when's the next time you see him? Well, um, Prior to the police leaving, um, they left me, you know, with the great reassurance of saying, you know, if he calls, uh, I mean, if he shows up, give us a call. Mm -hmm. And I actually pulled one of the cops aside and I said, listen, here's the deal. Right. I said, you know, this guy's coming. I said, it's I believe, you know, he already did a, a 13 years in prison. He made it clear that he's not going back to prison as a pedophile. I said, He's showing up here and it's going to be something along the lines of suicide by cop minus the cop because he knows what, you know, that I'm going to defend. Uh, like we know each other. Mm -hmm. um, so the cop says, yeah, call us if he shows up. And I told them what we were going to do. I told them I was going to and be outside and, uh, you know, protect the kids at all costs. And he kind of, there was like a minute of silence. He was looking at me, sizing me up. The, the, and he said, I would do the same. He said, but please call us as soon as he shows up so we could get on our way. And then they left. So that was early in the morning. So I was really nervous that this guy was going to come and that there was going to be chaos like there was the night before. Kids screaming, people all over the place. But I was unsure. Um as to how heavy James was going to come. I didn't know if he was going to come with a rifle. I, I had no idea what kind of capabilities he had. So I started to make a plan up. And the plan was that all the children and women were going to go into the basement um, and lock themselves in the basement. And my girlfriend, Carla, would be down there with the children. And she had a 12-gauge shotgun I gave her. And she was going to be, you know, defend if mm -hmm. he got into that far into the house and then into the basement so the whole day um i i am drilling it into the children exactly what they were going to supposed to do when they heard the word muster um that was the cue to for them everybody to be in the position uh, uh me and my father-in-law mike the, the children's grandfather we uh, I gave him a pistol. He didn't have any firearms. So I gave him a pistol and I had a pistol. And at this point, we're open carrying. I live on a 16 acre farm on a very quiet, dead end road with only three houses on it. So that was the plan. I mean, that everybody knew what they were supposed to do when he showed up. 
Um, yeah, you know, I'm always talking about um, if you're the defender, just in a normal situation, not anything kind of crazy like you're talking about, but just if you're the person in your family who carries a gun or whatever, or is a self-defense minded person to have a conversation with your family about what to do if, and now this is like, you know, if you get robbed on the street or someone tries to break into your house. Um, but in this instance, you have a very specific threat that you're almost certain this is going to transpire at some point. It's just a matter of when, by the way, what a terrible feeling, um, to be sitting around waiting to respond to a crazy person coming to, to, to you harm. I can't even imagine how that must've felt. Um, yes. And yes. And by this point I was awake more than 24 hours at this point without sleep. Is there anyone else in this group of people that you feel like could could be on point we call it in law enforcement being on the eye like watching for something is there somebody else you would have trusted to do that while you took a nap or you kind of it was just kind of just you it, it it was me um at one point um well like i said my father-in-law too but at the time he's 67 years old okay um so i felt it was up to me i did call a friend and um i had him come over and i gave him um a rifle and he was inside of the house uh at the must, at, you know, uh, his his position when we mustered was to go and cover the first floor. He was inside the house, dead bolted. If somebody came through that door, he was going to defend with the rifle. Um, and me and Mike were outside. Waiting so for him. during this time of preparation, and I commend you for coming up with a plan, not just waiting around to get killed, but coming up with a plan and preparing to defend yourself and these kids and everyone else. During this time, are you contemplating, for example, okay, if he come, if he bursts through the door, but he's not armed, uh, what am I going to do? And um, will I be able to defend that decision? For example, he bursts through the door, and you, for somehow, you are able to determine he has no weapons on him. It's just him, and you shoot him. Uh, am I am I going to have cr face criminal charges? That sort of thing Was, is that sort of thing going through your their mind during the interim the interim period of time. Um, criminal charges never crossed my mind, um, because, um, again, this guy's, uh, got a violent criminal past. He's done over a decade in prison. Um, the police are notified that he's threatening me, you know, that he threatened to kill me. And I was never inside. I stayed, um, I, I kept the perimeter on the outside the entire time. I never actually went inside at all. Okay, and is this the the person in question, the suspect in question, is he a big muscular guy? Like, is is he the kind of guy you wouldn't want to have to fist fight with, or or is that not the case? Uh, yes, he's he's big. He did thirteen years in prison. Um, he's, you know, yeah, big, much bigger than me. Okay, all right, fair enough. So at some point, um, let me digress for a moment. So you've you've given all the kids the code word, what to do. I assume they're in the house doing whatever they're doing. And with the understanding that if they hear the word muster, it's time for everyone to go down to the basement, lock themselves in. It's time for your girlfriend to, to grab a shotgun and make everyone safe down there. Um, at some point, he he shows up. Are you able to see him coming down this long dirt road? I mean, I assume that was part part of the advantage of where you live is you can't. It's hard to sneak up on you, right? Correct. So, um, in a way, we got lucky because um, uh, his his James's wife um, she took the vehicle. He didn't have access to another vehicle. So it was about 11 p.m. at night. And um, and I'm sitting outside with my father-in-law and I see headlights coming down the street. It wasn't a dirt road. It's a street, but there's no street lights. And I had all the exterior lights off. So we're just sitting there in lawn chairs kind of up against my garage. And I see headlights coming down and then they stop. But nobody ever drives down there at night. It's like I said, there's three houses in our neighborhood, and then the road goes a half mile down and dead ends into riding stables, horse, horse stables. And uh, so I see the headlights stop, and then they, uh, I couldn't see the car. I could just see the lights reflecting off my house. And I know that they stopped, and then the car started going again. So... It passes my house and I walk to the front of my house because I was sitting up in the back because it's kind of elevated. I had a commanding view over the property. So I'm standing in the front of my house, about 20 yards to the front of my house, and everything is dark there. So 
uh, the car goes down the half mile, turns around at the stables and is coming back. And I decided that I was going to walk out into the road and just see who, who it was, mm -hmm. like who's driving. And as I turned around, um, there, I see him pop out from the bushes and walk right up onto my front porch. So at this point, are you, you're now in the road and he's all of a sudden on your front porch. I stopped short of the road and I was kind of in the shadows under a big maple shade tree and uh, he never saw me, but I watched him pop out of the bushes and head up onto the, my porch. So someone had dropped him off. It was an Uber. Oh, yes. Okay. I was going to say, I wanna... in hindsight, I know that. I didn't know that then. Sure. I, otherwise, could... I'd want to have a definite conversation with whoever it was who dropped him off. I mean, that's that's crazy, but it's an Uber. So, okay, no harm, no foul. Yeah. On the and, Uber's part. and he... And he got dropped off a half a mile up the road from my house. He gave them a different address. So we, we got all the Uber records uh, through the court. Um, so he got dropped off down the road and walked down the street to get to my house. So now you're in the uncomfortable position of not being of him being between you and the people you're trying to protect and being able to, to give the code word and all that sort of thing. That must have been an awful feeling. Um. Well, you know, at, at first, um, I was just kind of shocked. And I just, I stood there for a minute and I'm watching him and he walks up on my front porch and he's trying to look down through the mini blinds into the living room uh, and the couch with the children sleeping on it are literally right there. Oh, and man. then I watch him walk to my front door and try to look through the blinds there. And then he went back to the window and I'm just watching him the whole time and didn't say a word. So at some so, point, you have to confront this guy, obviously. Does he try to get in the house, or do you talk to him before that happens? No, I talk to him before that happens. I probably watched for 10, 15 seconds. And then I drew my pistol and kind of walked up maybe to maybe 15 yards away from him. And I said, James, is that you? And he turned around like a deer in headlights, totally was not expecting me to be behind him. Um, yeah, I can imagine. And, and yeah, and he turns around and he says, yeah. And immediately I yelled, he's here, muster and call the cops. Okay. Now I'm sure he, that probably left him a little bit confused with what you said. Um, did he, when, when he said, yeah, the, your tone of voice in, in recollecting that sounds a little defeated. Did, did he seem like, Oh no, I'm, I'm busted. This isn't going to work out. Or, or what was, what was your oh. gauge of his uh, attitude in that moment? Yeah. He was like a deer in headlights at that point. Um, he was, he was shocked that I was behind him. He thought this was 11 PM at night and all the exterior lights on the house were off and, uh, the interior lights were on. So he was probably thinking we were turned in for the night. Like mm -hmm. he wasn't expecting anybody to be outside. So you said so, deer in the headlights. Speaking of lights, are you, do you have a flashlight or a gun mounted light or anything? Or are you in, just in the dark as he is? Ah, so that, yeah, so that's a funny story because I have done some low light training and um, so I don't know how long it was, but basically everybody musters, I could hear the doors, people running, the kids going down and I kind of wait for a second and I'm holding him at gunpoint and uh, I hear the, do the, the, the door slam and the deadbolt close and then I start ordering him off my property get out, get out of here, get off my property. And I'm trying to push him back the whole time. I have a flashlight in my pocket, but I never actually thought to pull it out. And the guy I had in on the first floor with the rifle had a surefire X 300 on the rifle and he lit them up through the window. Wow. And that's when I realized, Oh yeah, I got a flashlight in my pocket and I pulled out and deployed the flashlight. So in this moment, uh, I don't know if you're thinking of this in the moment. What I what I almost certainly would be giving some consideration to at some point during this whole thing is, all right, he's here now. Um, at this moment, the odds of of having to use a firearm are pretty slim. You're probably thinking he's going to give up or run away or something. But w regardless of what you're thinking in that moment, I would be thinking to myself, okay, so we, we stopped him before he got in the house. Great. Now he's going to run away and I got to do this all over again. I got to set up front of my house in, into perpetuity until he shows up again or, or what? Cause the police can't 
station someone outside your house 24 hours a day. Um, are, is any of that going through your mind in this moment or what's, what are you thinking? No, um, actually, uh, surprisingly, I was very calm and um, I'm just ordering him. I want him to leave at this point and I'm yelling for him to get off the property. I'm giving him verbal commands. I'm yelling at him to sure. get off my property and leave. And then at probably, I don't know how long, 30 seconds, maybe less than a minute, my father-in-law came around the side of the house and then he, he drew his firearm on him as well. And it, now James was not intimidated by the firearm at all. He mm -hmm. was not intimidated. He was not complying at all. Um, and as a matter of fact, he has a beer in his hand. That's all I could see what he has in his hands. And he's holding it close. It's a tall can of beer. And uh, once Mike came around, I, he, he, James wasn't complying. So I, I really didn't know what to do at this point. And I'm thinking to go hands on. I start telling him to get on the ground. He's just not listening to anything. He's just he wasn't he wasn't intimidated at all by the firearms. Yeah, and that's something we'll talk more about this later. But that's something you have to prepare yourself for. Um talking to the audience now, as a self-defender, is um the presence of a firearm may or may not uh convince the person that you're dealing with. Uh, that you mean business or to stop doing what they're doing. Frequently, someone who's had a lot of interactions with the police has had guns pull on a number of times and just it doesn't phase them at all. And that seems to be what was happening here with this this uh, individual. Yes. So now my father-in-law is at 90 degrees to me. So really, we're in a great position. There can't be any, you know, uh, if either one of us fires, you know, we're both safe. And I think he realized when I told him, get on the ground, he he started to kind of panic a little bit because uh, it, it, that the situation escalated pretty quick from there. Mike came around the corner and and I think because uh, I was shining the light in his face, he really couldn't see me. But Mike couldn't didn't have a light and my the, the light was lighting up Mike a little bit. So when he turned, he could see Mike was lit up. And Mike is the grandfather of the children, my father-in-law. So they start going back and forth. He, James starts yelling, shoot me. And, and I, there's just words exchanged and it got real crazy fast. James is, well, Mike, let me see. So James throws the beer can at Mike and goes to charge at him. And I'm talking close. Like he got within six feet of him probably. And Mike kind of went off balance a little bit trying to dodge the beer can. And as he, he leaned back a little bit and he let one shot in. And it hit him in the lower abdomen, bounced off his pelvis, and came out basically where his butthole is. And he hit the ground fast and hard. What we didn't know at the time is, in the other hand, he had a knife. Oh boy. Um, and he was charging at Mike to poke some holes in him. So during the period of time when he's charging, nobody was aware of the presence of the knife? It was... Okay. No, we were not. No. All right. So I think some of our audience members might be asking, without that knowledge of the knife, was Mike justified in pulling the trigger? Well, there, there's, there's a lot to be said about that. He's an older gentleman. He's dealing with a stronger, younger person. All, all these things are factors that are going to come into play when the legal system decides whether what you did was justified or not. And of course, with the presence of a knife, it's a no brainer, obviously. But I, I think it's important to note. Yeah, I think an older guy with with a with an ex con with a, a convicted felon who's been threatening people and now shows up. Um, it's dark. He's younger and stronger. Yeah, I think he's just fine. Um, who saw the knife first and, and, and what happened at that point? Well, actually, so he hits the ground and um, uh, he, he starts yelling, you killed me, you killed me. I mean, he's in a lot of pain. He just got shot in the abdomen with a forty-five. I mean, it was a 180 grain bullet and it, it did some damage. He hit the ground. He's screaming. He actually threw the knife into the bushes while he was laying on the ground. My brother-in-law, Mike Jr., saw it and he yelled, there's something in his hand. There's something in his hand. But I went back up to him and I didn't see anything in his hand. And again, the knife was found in the bushes. Um, 
after the fact, you know, after the police started their investigation. Yeah, I bet I bet that forty five left an impression. In your defense, he did ask you to shoot him. He he was asking to be shot and uh he, he got shot. And um to add to being justified, um this is a, a, a violent felon with a criminal past that's on the run. I mean, the police did try to pick him up on a warrant for threatening, and now he's trespassing on my property that, you know, the person that he threatened. So I, I feel that it was justified all the way around. And yeah, the courts course. did as well. So walk us through what happens after this. So now he's he's down. Is is he attempting to get up and flee? Is he is he trying to move around? Is he just laying there uh whining? Uh, he's just laying there yelling. He, I don't think he could move when the um, the bullet went in and it bounced off his pelvis. It fractured his pelvis, ricocheted out um, this, yeah, like out of his butt cheek. And uh, it was a run through. He, he uh, when, when he got hit, both hands went down to where, you know, the bullet went in and he kind of like staggered back a step or two and hit the ground and that was it he didn't move after that but he yelled he was screaming a lot yeah my understanding um and i've heard this from more than one person it's a it's called the pelvic girdle i think is what it's called that whole area and that is apparently the most painful place to be shot more than your private parts more than anywhere else that uh to strike the pelvis or something about that i don't know what it is exactly but i've been told that's extremely painful so that's that's sad news for him i guess so at some point um someone's calling the police at some point someone's checking on the kids and the people downstairs kind of walk us through how that how that evolved so um you know he's on the ground he's yelling and screaming and um you know my father-in-law mike um he was the one that fired the shot so at that point um i think he he started to get nervous because you know there's a good possibility well we're definitely, you know, taking a ride with the police. So he goes and hugs all his grandchildren. At that point, I get on the phone with the uh, call 911 and explain to them that we just shot them, that we're, the firearms are going to be, you know, telling the police where the firearms are going to be, that, you know, our hands are going to be up. I really didn't want them to come in hot and, and draw firearms on us and make a situation worse. Sure. So Mike is hugging his grandbabies and, and, you know, possibly saying goodbye to them, you know, for a while. And it probably took from the time the first 911 call went in to the time that the cop showed up was probably close to 10, 11 minutes, something like that. And I know I people are probably tired of me saying this, like they're tired of us talking about how, an impo how important a good light is on the main channel. They're tired of me saying it, but uh, 11 minutes is l quite literally an eternity under a situation like this. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah, so if, if, if all you had at your disposal was calling 911, uh, this would have ended very differently had you not been armed and not had a plan. Uh, 11 minutes is, is just too, um, uh, you know, three minutes is, is more time than it would take for this to have gone down some other way. So um, the police show up. You, you had told dispatchers, hey, the guns are going to be here. We're going to be unarmed. Hands are up. Uh, walk us through what happens when they when they actually get there. So I live in a little town of, of less than 10,000 people. And uh, the officer that showed up, he pulled into my driveway a little fast. He He was... Uh, older. He was probably at the tail end of his career. And my town hasn't had a shooting in over 40 years. So this was probably the last thing he wanted to do. And he came in a little fast into the driveway and had to slam the brakes on because he almost ran James over oh. because James was laying in the middle of my driveway and it was dark. Uh, again, all the exterior lights were off. Um, <laughs> so he had to back up and then re-pull back in on the grass and I'm standing up by the vehicles and I got my hands up and uh, he, the police officer gets out. And I said, I said to him, both guns are right there. They're registered to me. And uh, and I, I showed him the guns and he picked them up off of the hood of the car. All right. So, so far, so good. It would have been a shame if you to run James over. Oh, um, yeah. So, what a shame. <laughs> so uh, it, I assume at some point you're you're answering questions. You're, you're talking to the police about what happened, walking them through it. Are any of the officers who respond that night the same ones who were already been involved with this case or is it different different uh, individuals? Um, no, the, the officer that responded was a single officer and he was 
work nights apparently and i actually have never seen them because again our town is very small i think like on average they might have two cops patrolling um uh so i've only seen a few cops and they're very friendly i've never saw this one but no there was a shooting involved so now state police major crimes units got to show up okay and how long does that take um it's hard to say we weren't well Walking them through anything. Um, wh- when they got there, they um, they handcuffed Mike because he fired the shot. They did not handcuff me. And then Mike Jr., who was outside at the time of the shooting, we were all separated and put into the back of uh, of of uh, police cars. Okay. And how how does Mike respond? Mike Senior respond to being handcuffed? Is he kind of expecting it? Is he resigned to it, thinking, "Okay, this is just procedure," or is it, is he now worried he's going to jail? Um, I I think he was very worried um, that he was going to go to jail. Um, I I knew you know that we were justified. I was a hundred percent sure. But to be honest with you, I don't know because they separated us, and um, you know they we were in separate vehicles and we couldn't even see each other. So at some point, I, I assume they take you somewhere to, to discuss this, a police station or, or an interview room. Yeah. Well, at first, I mean, they pulled up these big light plants and man, they lit up my yard, which is a big 10 acre field. Like it was like a, a stadium. I mean, it was like daylight with these big giant light plants that they had set up there. And we sat in the back of the vehicles for a couple hours at, at the very minimum and then they took us down to the state police barracks um, to, to interview us um, separately. Okay. And what's that like? Walk us through that situation. Uh, you're you're in a room by yourself. Somebody walks in. What happens? What do they say? Um, well, first, um, they were kind of not nice at first. Um, and, you know, they, he was kind of getting like a little wise with me saying, well, if you're so confident with your firearm skills, why would you... Um, uh, give Mike a gun. And I said, well, how many times do you guys roll into a situation one deep, you know, and I kind of gave it back to him. I was actually getting very upset with them. And then I think they realized, um, you know, they, they, um, tested our hands for the gunshot residue and then they kind of settled down a little bit. And I gave my statement. Um, I, I didn't lawyer up or anything like that. Um, I know, they say you should, but I just, I mean, it, it is what it, it, it was. I just told them how it went down. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's what's, what's done is done. Uh, I, I would, you know, as a disclaimer, I would recommend having firearms legal protection or, or some other insurance, preferably FLP. We're, we're fans of them. They're a sponsor and be able to, to discuss uh, this with an attorney before talking to the police that that wasn't the case in your case. And that's fine. Um, I, I, I think it's interesting that initially they're, they're accusatory. I mean, you, you ask a question, why did you give Mike a gun? Well, it turns out he needed it. As it turns out, um, he, he had a, he had a angry felon with a knife in his hand running at him. So I'm glad Mike had that gun. That's kind of a silly question. If you ask me, um, how long are you, are you guys detained for? And is Mike ever even, is he ever sniff a criminal charge or is it, or are they, are you guys released? No, um, maybe you know, we're in the back of the car for a couple hours and then at least a couple more hours at the state police barracks. And then um, they they let us all go. No charges were ever brought um, by the state uh, against us. So at some point you b- between uh, the shooting and you being detained, are you able to check on the kids and the other folks down there? Are you able to talk to them or, or do they just stay in the basement until the stuff's cleared out? Um, you know, none of the kids came up at that point. Um, some of the adults did. And basically we had enough time to, um, cause I didn't want them to come out. You know, James was still in, in the, in the driveway screaming and yelling. And, and, uh, so of course I wanted to keep everybody away from that. So I really, mm, you know, maybe just had a chance to say, oh, I'll see you later. That's about it. So you're cut loose from the police station like what time of day is this now i assume it's oh much this later is in the day. geez uh th- this is probably like three in the morning at this point i mean i've been up probably close to 48 hours at this point are you able to get any sleep that night uh no no i was so amped up i i couldn't i was no not at all so let's talk about the the post-shooting part of it um 
I assume he goes to the hospital and they patch him up and he ends up getting charged. Uh, c- kind of walk us through the criminal justice process. This case has been dispoed, I assume now. He's been convicted and sentenced? He's been sentenced to 35 years in prison, yes. Okay, so once once the dust settles from this, now it's a few days later, are you contacted by the district attorney, by the state's attorney or whatever, or by the police to testify or walk us through that part of it? Oh, so here's the best part. As I mentioned, I was in oil and gas. So I had to travel um, actually to Texas and um, they released him. They released him because it takes time to build a case uh, of, of uh, molestation. And uh, so they actually released him on bond because the only thing they could hold him on was threatening charges. And now he's on the loose and I'm in Texas, oh, which boy. was a horrible, horrible feeling. Um, I called the detective and I mean, I went off on him and he was such a nice guy, but I mean, I was so stressed out and he's, you know, kind of let me know uh, uh, as well as he could uh, without violating, uh, violating the HIPAA laws that mm, he's not in any, you know, he can't pose a da- danger to anybody at this point. He's pretty roughed up from being shot with a 45. Yeah, it's unfortunate. So. Once you get back from Texas, I assume you're involved somehow in the trial and in, in, in the um, the legal proceedings. Um, are you? Are you end up having to testify in court? I had to testify in court, and um, you know the the shooting aspect, that that self defense aspect of it was such a small part of the actual trial. I mean, it, it was pretty much um, the prosecutors really barely cared about it. Um, they were going after the big charges on him. But what I could tell you is that one um, state's uh, attorney, the prosecutor, uh, Amy, she was great. And there was another guy, Don, that was so anti-gun and uh, the judge. And they were super bitter, Uh, like they would scold us and uh, about how they disapproved of the way they did things so much to the point where. I told them, listen, Don, either shut your mouth or charge me with something, because as far as I'm concerned, if you had something, you would have already charged me. I mean, they were so anti-gun, it isn't even fun. Well, this is Connecticut. I mean, yes, it's not exactly um, the most conservative pro-gun place in the world to be, which is which is partly why I asked some of the questions earlier about about Mike Sr. and his his concern about being charged, because that always is a possibility. It seems ridiculous to people, just like it seems ridiculous this guy would get let out, but there's, it's just the way the criminal justice system works. If they don't have enough evidence to hold him for the serious felony charges, they can't they can't just hold him because it's a good idea, because they're worried about what he might do. That's just the way the system is set up, and it's certainly uh, imperfect. Let's talk for just a second about lessons. Now, you mentioned, before we started here, you mentioned you were in the oil and gas industry, and that gave you some... Um, sort of a model or basis for the plan that you came up with. Talk to us about how that how that came to be. Okay, so for every, every time we go to a new location, um, we have to, um, there's like these booklets. We basically have to sketch out the location and it's called like an emergency action plan. So um, if something goes wrong, uh, uh, if there's an injury, everybody musters to a certain point. Uh, you know, so basically we have to evaluate the whole um, the whole site and write down every danger we might encounter. And then every day we have to fill out twice a day, actually, a job site analysis, a JSA, and those hazards would be on there as well. And everybody would have to sign off at the safety meeting um, uh prior to starting work every day um, on the JSA and the EPA. So I took that model of of identifying hazards and potential hazards and exactly where everybody's supposed to be and what everybody's supposed to do. I took that model and applied it to this situation because my biggest fear in this situation wasn't James. It was actually having um, panicked people running around where they shouldn't be during the fight. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So I think think some of the lessons we can take from this, uh, number one, have a plan. If you have an active threat, something that's, you know, going on, not just a generalized idea that you might be broken into or or mugged on the street or carjacked, but you, when you have a specific threat, um, have a plan. Have, have some idea of what you're going to do. Give people instruction. If you're the self-defender, make sure you have that 
more generalized conversation about what to do if something happens. And, you know, if, you know, if dad's gun comes out, kids, here's what I want you to do or, or to your spouse or mom's gun comes out. Here's what you do. Uh, number two, be ready, be fully prepared. Uh, when you draw a gun during a conflict like this, for it to have zero effect on the attitude of the person you're dealing with, because someone who's been around a long time, been to prison a few times, had guns pointed at him in the past, uh, is probably figuring you're not, you don't mean it. You're not going to do it. Or they don't care if they get shot or not. That's another possibility. Um, be prepared also to be detained after a situation like this, be prepared to be handcuffed, be prepared to be, uh, asked aggressive questions, even though you think everything you did was in the right and it was in the right. Don't anticipate law enforcement or a prosecutor is going to see it that way. Uh, and I would say for sure, have firearms legal protection and talk to an attorney before you talk to the police. In this case, it worked out. Um, it worked out in a place that isn't terribly gun friendly. So that's even doubly surprising that it worked out as well as it did. And I really like what you said. Um, you're on the phone with the dispatcher. You're calling the police. You're like, okay, well, there there are guns involved. Someone's been shot. Here's the condition of the guns. Here's where they're going to be to sort of diffuse any concern by the responding um, officers or deputies as far as uh, guns still, still being in play. Now, was there anything else we failed to talk about or mention that you want to talk about? I don't want to forget anything, Anthony. Um, no, I, but the, you know, the biggest lesson that I take out of this is, um, you're responsible for your own safety and defense. I honestly believe that if we didn't have the tools and the plan to step up to defend these children, I believe the whole family would have been dead because he would have much rather go to prison as a murderer or go down doing his crime, than go back to prison marked as a pedophile yeah there's good reason for that um and i think you're right uh, he showed up there inebriated um he'd already shown a propensity for violence in the extreme and he had everything to lose uh and i, I think you guys did what you absolutely had to do that night what a what an intense story uh and i think without your preparation without your foresight um without your training and without uh, firearms, frankly, you're, you're right. I think there would have been a bloodbath there that night, which you prevented. Anthony, I want to thank you so much, first of all, for having the courage to write in and, and discuss this with me. Without folks like you um, out there willing to talk about this stuff, there would be no active self-protection podcast. It would be me alone in a room talking to myself, and nobody wants to hear that. Uh, so I thank you again for coming on, and, uh, and I want you to take good care, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. All righty, gang. It is that time once again for the Gutowski Files featuring, starring, you decide, Stephen Gutowski. Stephen is the founder of the Reload.com and the host of the Weekly Reload podcast. Speaking of which, Stephen, first of all, welcome. Uh, who was on your podcast this week? Tell us about that so our viewers and listeners can go check it out. This week we had uh, Amy Swearer, who is the gun policy expert from the Conservative uh, Heritage Foundation. So she is the one who's testifying on Capitol Hill, oftentimes from the pro-gun side of the hearings, and we talked about President Biden's executive order and what it exactly it does and what some of the concerns that gun owners might have with that order, and then also how realistic it is to, to see him try to push things to the absolute limit with this order and whether or not it's actually a sign that he may be losing steam on the issue, running out of runway, so to speak, on what he can do on guns. Very good. So go check that out over at The Reload. Also consider getting a membership over there. Uh, we highly recommend that you do. Stephen is doing important work that no one else is doing. So check him out at TheReload.com. Uh, so this week we are discussing an article that came out, let us see, yesterday, March 20th. It's the 21st as we record this. Uh, the headline is Federal Judge Blocks California Handgun Restrictions. Um, and I love the first line of this. Uh, this is up there with some of the best uh, of all time. California can't ban residents from buying modern handguns. Well, that's a fine. How do you do, Stephen? So tell us um, about the restrictions that they had proposed and and what the federal judge had to say. Yeah, so that's the ruling, right? They they can't ban Californians from buying the latest handguns, which is what they've been doing for about a decade now, um, and really dating back to 2001 this law is called the California unsafe handgun law which which imposes what people in California would know as the handgun roster which is a a group of a couple hundred handguns that you are allowed to buy legally in California as a normal person 
law enforcement, of course, is not subject to these restrictions for, even though, again, this is supposed to be about whether or not the guns are safe. Apparently, California lawmakers are okay with police owning unsafe, hang, at least what they claim to be unsafe handguns. Uh, but everyone else is subject to this roster, to these restrictions, which essentially include a number of either really uncommon safeties, like, for instance, a magazine disconnect safety, which makes it so that a gun can't fire if there's no magazine inserted, even if it has a round in the chamber. This is one of the required safeties in this bill. Uh, and then also theoretical technology. Uh, so micro stamping is something that is also required under this bill in California, which is a technology that in theory would imprint a, the gun would have to imprint a specialized, unique identifying mark on every casing for every round that it fired um, in order to help police trace spent casings at crime scenes. As we said theory. here before, that doesn't, that technology doesn't exist yet. It's not, that's not a thing, right? Exactly. Yes, that's the problem. That's why there hasn't been a new model of handgun approved in, for the sale in the state of California since 2013, because that's when the micro stamping rule went into effect. There's no uh, gun in the world that has this technology, not over in Europe where they have much stricter gun laws or Asia or what have you. And no Ameri no gun for sale anywhere in America has this micro stamping technology. A lot of people, the, crit the critique of it beyond the you know tracking aspects are that it's not feasible to implement. And that's why it hasn't been implemented, even though in 2013, California rule, you know, they determined the attorney general determined that it was viable at that point, 10 years ago. But uh, like, we, like I've just said, there's have not actually been any guns made with micro stamping technology. There's been plenty of guns made with uh, magazine disconnects and loaded chamber. And one of the other requirements is a loaded chamber indicator. That's actually a fairly common uh, feature now on most modern firearms, but that's something that has those two features have actually been made into guns that are sold in California. Right. But micro stamping hasn't. And the judge in this case, and this is uh, federal district judge Cormac Carney, who's a George W. Bush appointee. He ruled that essentially because micro stamping completely eliminates the new sale of new new models of pistols, that it's unconstitutional. He, he said, quote, Californians have the constitutional right to acquire and use state-of-the-art handguns to protect themselves. They should not be forced to settle for decade-old models of handguns to ensure that they remain safe inside or outside the home. Interesting. So do you know offhand, Stephen, are there any other states or anywhere else uh, within the judicial district where uh, laws are similar to this that might be um, overturned or, or done away with because of this ruling? Yes, there are states that are pursuing this technology. It's relatively recent, uh, pursuing the same sort of restriction with micro stamping. Uh, Massachusetts is one. New Jersey is another one. Uh, you've seen some proposals in other states. Uh, but it, for the most part, the only one that has this in effect right now, I believe, is California. I don't think the Massachusetts one has gone into effect yet. But but it is something that in very recent history, really post-Bruin backlash in some of these deeper blue states that have produced more gun restrictions after that Supreme Court ruling, uh, the, the, you're seeing some of these micro stamping requirements come up there. So yeah, this ruling could have an effect in California, but also throughout the country for sure. So Chuck Michael, is it Chuck Michael? Am I pronouncing that correctly? The, the head of the CRPA? I think it's Chuck Michelle. Michelle? Okay, very good. Um, there's a quote in your article from him uh, where he says, for decades, this roster law has deprived self, or excuse me, law-abiding citizens with the right to choose a handgun appropriate for their individual needs. Um, I can tell you that's true. I lived in California for 22 years. And, uh, you know, as, as a federal agent at the time, uh, I had the the uh, wonderful opportunity to carry whatever I wanted because I, I was a federal agent. Mm -hmm. But uh, for a time, uh, there was some scuttlebutt that never really panned out. But there was some scuttlebutt that the state wasn't going to allow uh, the feds, because we're not peace officers under California law, to carry high capacity mm. magazines. And there, it became a bit of a contentious issue. It never did come to pass. Uh, that would have been interesting um, had it had it come mm. to pass. 
But the the restrictions on guns in California are so ridiculous that it's kind of a running joke, um, like bullet buttons on ARs and and you know all, all sorts of things uh, to to where it just it's it's patently obvious to the average Californian who wants to own a gun that the state just doesn't want you to. I mean that's what it comes down to in my opinion. Yeah. This ruling is a great thing in, in my opinion again. Yeah, I mean I think that's fairly um, uh, fairly evident from the way that they regulate firearms in California, that the, oftentimes the goal is just not for people to not buy them uh, altogether. So, but either way, this, this ruling, uh, there were some other holes in the, in the requirements, mainly around the police exemption, because police could actually buy these guns, right? They get, police, you couldn't buy a Glock Gen 4 as a California resident, but police could, and then they could resell them to regular residents. So uh, that actually led to some some fairly obvious problems um, <clears throat> the, down the line. But uh, it, it certainly will be interesting to see exactly where this progresses. I mean, you, you know, you've got a federal judge here um, using the Bruin standard. So that's another important aspect of this mm-hmm. case. Is it's one of the first California cases to come down under this new Bruin standard that the Supreme court set last year for handling gun cases moving forward. And, you know, it came out in favor of the gun rights advocates in this case, Chuck, Chuck Michelle being the head of the California rifle and pistol association, which was one of the plaintiffs in the case. And so it could signal that a lot of California's laws are likely to be, to face really difficult legal fights in the months ahead because of Bruin. Uh, They already were, of course, you know, there's been decades worth of legal fights over California's strictest in the nation gun laws, but now they're, the state is in even more of a defensive position because of the standard that was set in this. You you have to show that these modern restrictions have some sort of historical basis and you don't have to show that there's an exact twin, right? Micro stamping, Technology, which technically doesn't really exist in production anywhere today, also didn't exist, of course, in 1792 or 1791. Right. And, and so obviously there, you know, there's no exact match in history, but you, that's not really how Broom works. You, you can also look for historical analogs if there's modern technology that's developed since the founding era that's created a specific modern societal issue. And that's what a lot of these cases are coming down to. But you do still have to have some kind of analog. And so California pointed to a couple of things. There were proofing laws at the founding where basically inspectors could examine barrels to make sure that they uh, didn't blow up, mm-hmm. basically. Um, there was gunpowder storage laws about ensuring that gunpowder was stored so that it wouldn't accidentally ignite and set the whole town on fire, right? And so those were the, sort of the analogs they used for these unsafe handgun restrictions and and judge uh the judge in this case judge cormick said that's not these aren't actually good fits for what you're trying to accomplish here it's not the how and why are too far apart for these to be appropriate analogs and that's why he struck down this law he said quote because enforcing those uh, requirements um, implicates the plain text of the Second Amendment, and the government fails to point to any well-established historical analogs that are consistent with them. Those requirements are unconstitutional, and their enforcement must be preliminary enjoined. Preliminarily enjoined. So he, he issued an injunction. That's one important point, though, before people in California rush out to their local gun store after listening to the segment. This injunction doesn't go into effect for two weeks. And that's specifically so California can have the time, if they choose, to appeal this decision and ask the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which would be overseeing this case, to put a stay on the lower court ruling, which would mean that it wouldn't actually go into effect. So that's really important for the practical aspect of all this. Uh, The Attorney General, Rob Bonte, is a Democrat. He said... Quote, the fact of the matter is California's gun safety laws save lives and California's Unsafe Handgun Act is no exception. No, they don't. We will continue to lead efforts to advance and defend California's gun safety laws. As we move forward to determine the next steps in this case, Californians should know 
that this injunction has not gone into effect and that California's important gun safety requirements related to the un- Unsafe Handgun Act remain in effect. So in other words, if you go to your local gun store tomorrow in California, there won't be SIG P365s available yet. There's, you know, there's not going to be Glock Gen 5s in there for sale to uh, non-police officers, at least. And uh, so uh, practically speaking, it doesn't have an immediate effect on, though clearly Bonta has not committed to appealing. I think, I mean, California has basically appealed all of these cases whenever they've lost at the district level. Mm -hmm. So I'd be really surprised if he doesn't appeal it. Uh, Maybe this is one where they feel like the micro stamping stuff has got them so far out on a limb that they might not want to appeal it. We'll have to wait and see. Usually California doesn't take that position when it comes to their gun laws, though. Indeed, they do not. So that's it for this week, folks. Do me a favor. Go over to TheReload.com and carefully consider getting a membership. As I said earlier at the opening, Stephen relies on his membership fees to fund his important work when he's not out gallivanting on CNN. You know, big stuff, big time. <laughs> Vitalski's big time. Um, do that and do me a favor in whatever format you're watching this on, whether it's YouTube or um, uh, Apple Podcasts, whatever. Go leave us a five-star review and a rating. Um, tell us what you like about it. Tell us what you don't like about it. We, we'd love to know. Stephen, thank you again, and we'll see you next week. Yeah, I, I want to get CNN to start saying featuring or starring yeah, Stephen should. Vitalski anytime I go on there. Should have done that from the yeah, start. I'm going I'm to ask the producers about that. All right, buddy. We'll see you next week. All right. Absolutely.